video, we are starting our discussions on metabolism, starting with chapter 14 from Voigt, Voigt, and Pratt. More specifically, we're covering the materials from sections 1 and 2 in this chapter. So we will actually be working on material in this chapter over three class meetings, covering um, S21 in our workbook, understanding the rate determining step in a multi-step process, S23, understanding metabolically far from equilibrium steps, and S24, high energy compounds. This material serves as an introduction to metabolism and is foundational for the rest of the material we'll be covering in the term. This is exactly why we're spending so much time in class on just one lecture. While we will not cover sections 3 and 4 in detail, please note that the concepts in section 3, redox reactions, will be readdressed when we discuss the electron transport chain, and the concepts in section 4 on isotopic labeling of metabolic intermediates will be utilized in a number of upcoming activities while we discuss glu uh, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, the citric acid cycle, and some of the other metabolic pathways. So I recommend at least reading over those two sections in your book. All right, so let's get started. Here are the learning outcomes for this chapter. Be sure to pause here, read over these outcomes, and kind of keep them in the back of your mind as we go through this lecture and as we go through the in-class activities later this week. So first, let's define metabolism. It is the overall process through which living systems acquire and use free energy from their surroundings to carry out various functions. Metabolism can be divided into two categories, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is where macromolecules are broken down in order to generate energy, typically stored as ATP, NADH, and NADPH. And anabolism is where macromolecules are synthesized by the cell from smaller, simpler compounds and typically requires energy input. Additionally, we can categorize organisms based on how they generate the energy needed to power metabolism. Photoautotrophs harness energy through sunlight, and heterotrophs, which harness energy through the metabolism breakdown of macromolecules generated from photoautotrophs and other heterotrophs. In nearly all metabolic processes, vitamins and minerals are required as cofactors or co-substrates of the enzymes that govern these pathways. And by definition, vitamins and minerals are small molecules that cannot be synthesized by eukaryotes and must be consumed via their diets. In Table 14.1, we can see that the various vitamins that are required in the human diet, the coenzyme products they produce, the metabolic reactions that they mediate, and the diseases that are caused when either our diets are deficient or we are metabolically unable to convert the vitamin to their coenzyme product. As previously mentioned, metabolism is a series of pathways that govern the breakdown or synthesis of macromolecules. All of these pathways are a series of interconnected enzyme-governed reactions. In our first flow chart, we are looking at a simplified flow for the breakdown or catabolism of our three major classes of biomolecules into common metabolites that are then fed into the citric acid cycle and used to generate energy. These macromolecules are proteins, sugars or polysaccharides, and fats. In the second flow chart, we are adding a layer of complexity by showing where our high energy molecules, or the energy currency of the cell, are consumed and produced in catabolism. Finally, in the third and most complex flow chart, we add in the various alternative catabolic pathways that exist, as well as all of the various anabolic pathways. As daunting as it may seem right now, we will actually investigate each of these various pathways individually and in context throughout the remainder of this course. As I've noted again and again, enzymes are responsible for controlling and catalyzing all of the steps in each metabolic process of the cell. There are generally four types of reactions we run across in metabolism. These are redox reactions, or the transfer of electrons from one molecule to another, 
group transfer reactions, where functional groups are moved from one molecule to another. Isomerizations and rearrangements, where functional groups are moved around on the same molecule. And reactions that make or break carbon-carbon bonds, where functional groups can be removed or added without a transfer from another molecule. All metabolic pathways are controlled typically in two ways, thermodynamics and kinetics. To illustrate the thermodynamic principle, let's look at how the energy landscape of glycolysis changes. In the graph here, we see the Gibbs free energy for each metabolite as glucose is converted to pyruvate. In the majority of the steps, we see that delta G is near zero and therefore close to equilibrium. These steps can be easily halted or reversed by changing the ratio of products to reactants per Le Chatelier's principle. For instance, if the product of a step begins to build up, the equilibrium will shift back towards reactants, halting the preceding steps accordingly. But as the pathway is moving forward and the metabolite of one step is quickly consumed by the next step, we have now created a steady state flow in the forward direction. However, we do notice that some steps function far from equilibrium and have a large negative delta G. These are therefore irreversible under the standard physiological conditions. These steps are said to generate metabolic flux and usually are the sites of enzymatic control. We will actually look more in depth at the first at that concept of metabolic flux and thermodynamic kinetic control in our in-class activities for this unit. Overall, the implications of thermodynamic control on metabolism is that in general, metabolic pathways are irreversible, especially once you've reached an early committed step early in the pathway. The cell has invested in continuing that path. Additionally, once we begin comparing coupled catabolic and anabolic pathways, such as glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, we will see that the metabolic steps that are near equilibrium share common reversible enzymes, while the far from equilibrium metabolic flux generating steps differ in their enzymes. This aspect of having different enzymes at key steps in opposing pathways allows us our second layer of metabolic control which is the kinetic or enzymatic control. By having key irreversible and far from equilibrium steps in the forward and reverse directions, we can easily and quickly turn off key enzymes of the opposing path. We can control these enzymes in a number of ways, through inhibitors or activators using allosteric control, through covalent modification, such as requiring phosphorylation prior to activation or deactivation, through substrate cycles, such as feedback inhibition or feed forward activation, and through genetic control, whether the enzyme is actually expressed or not. You can think of these steps as traffic lights for the pathway, ensuring that traffic is only flowing in one direction and that we don't end up in a futile substrate cycle, where as soon as a metabolite is made, is converted back to his substrate. To generate the energy needed in anabolic pathways, we must store free energy that is released during catabolic pathways using high energy compounds you see listed in this table. You can, think of, you can think of this as a sort of currency for the cell, where the breakdown of macromolecules allows us to save or bank energy that we can then spend later on when we need to make new macromolecules such as DNA or muscle protein. The most common high energy compound you have probably talked about in other classes is ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, which during complete dephosphorylation can release as much as 43 kilojoules of energy. Before we look at how ATP is used by the cell, let's first discuss why the dephosphorylation of ATP releases so much energy. First, the products of ATP dephosphorylation through hydrolysis is resonantly stabilized, meaning the lone pair of electrons on the oxygens can be shared more equally across the molecule. Additionally, hydrolysis of phosphate groups relieves some of the electrostatic tension between the negative charges found on the phosphate group oxygens. Lastly, the reaction is entropically favored both in terms of the number of products and in terms of the number of free waters released back into the bulk solvent. There is one other advantage to using ATP that doesn't have anything to do with thermodynamics but everything to do with kinetics. 
While we know the reaction is highly exergonic, in the absence of an enzyme, the kinetics of spontaneous hydrolysis is extremely slow, allowing the cell direct control of when ATP is hydrolyzed and when it is not. Now that we know why the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP or AMP is so exergonic, let's take a look at how the cell harnesses that energy in order to do work. When we hydrolyze ATP in an enzymatically controlled way, we can couple that release of energy with another reaction that is endergonic. As seen here, the phosphorylation of glucose in the first step of glycolysis is actually endergonic and requires 13.8 kilojoules per mole of energy. When coupled with the highly exergonic hydrolysis of ATP, which releases negative 30 kilojoules per mole, we end up with a net release of negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole, making what was on its own a non-spontaneous and highly endergonic reaction, both spontaneous and exergonic. As you will soon see when we do our in-class activities, our key regulatory steps in catabolic and anabolic pathways are often the steps that are coupled with ATP hydrolysis and release lots of energy. Which, if you step back and think about it, that makes sense. If the cell doesn't need to invest in a particular pathway, then that enzyme would be turned off so that precious stores of ATP are not depleted. While ATP is the most common high energy molecule discussed in undergraduate courses, there are a number of molecules that the cell can use to temporarily store and transfer energy as seen here. Often in catabolism, we start with low energy molecules such as G3P and G6P and work our way up to 1,3-BPG and PPP in order to generate metabolic flux. While in anabolic pathways, we start with higher energy compounds and work our way down. While NADH and FADH2 are themselves not energy storage molecules, they are just as important in anabolic and catabolic pathways. These molecules are used in electron transfer reactions known as oxidation reduction. When electrons are transferred along a reduction potential, such as we will see in the electron transport chain, energy is also released. And that energy can be stored as ATP. The stepwise transfer of electrons from one NADH molecule through the ETC to oxygen releases enough energy to make three molecules of ATP. We will revisit why this is in more detail in a few weeks. But for now, let's focus on learning how to identify key steps in metabolic pathways, how these steps are regulated, and how high energy compounds such as ATP are used by the cell to generate metabolic flux. I'll see you in class real soon. Mm -hmm.